Welcome, everyone. Um, we're very glad to have you here today. We're going to give it just a moment for people to arrive. Um, but if you can go ahead and get oriented here to the panel, there's a questions tab. And we'd love to know where you're joining us from. Um, so if you could type that in, and I can begin to share out as people continue to join. I'll give it just a minute. Got Key Largo, Florida, Kansas City, but she's moving to Chicago next week. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> they still live in Chicago. Dayton, Ohio, Utah. Well, great. Um, I know people will continue to join us and you can let us know in the questions tab where you're joining us from, but I wanted to go ahead and get started. Um, I am Kelly Haran, and I'm a member of our program team here at Guidepost Montessori. And I'm personally really looking forward to this topic today. Um, as a Montessori elementary educator, um, I know I've supported dozens of students with attention challenges and sensory processing difficulties and students on the autism spectrum and children with other developmental challenges, as well as typically developing children. Um, but I'm very grateful to have these three experts join us today um, to help provide more tools and understanding for parents and teachers and support staff um, who are helping to navigate this and seeking resources. So I first just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. I always like to let people know that we will be recording this. Um, just so that you're aware and also so that you can um, revisit it later or share it if you would like. It will be made available on the Guidepost Montessori YouTube channel. Um, if you have questions as our guests are speaking, and I, I hope that you do because we've allotted about half our time here to questions, um, if you would enter them in the questions tab that is in the panel um, over there on the right, or at least it is on my screen, and we will make sure that we have time to answer them. And in the meantime, if you want to go ahead and find that, if you haven't already, and you can let us know where you are joining us from. So um, I just wanted to, to go ahead and introduce our, our guest today from the Montessori Medical Partnership for Inclusion, MMPI. We're joined by Catherine Massey and Barbara Laborski and Michelle Lane. Oh, gosh. Ramapa. Thank you. I even asked beforehand and then I, I, I stumbled there. Um, no worries. <laughs> Catherine has been studying and researching Montessori education, special education, and the powerful impact of combining the two. Um, she received her Montessori diploma from Bergamo, Italy, and has a master's in teaching elementary and special education. Um, she also has experience as a Montessori mom of four. Um, and as an ORF music teacher, a Montessori teacher, a dyslexia tutor, um, and a Montessori school director. Um, Catherine was a founder of two, um, including the very first Montessori public charter school in Maryland. Um, and she has traveled internationally and presented extensively advocating for inclusive Montessori um, schools through the integrated application of scientific and medical pedagogy. And we will next hear from Barbara. Um, Catherine's going to be sort of um, she's going to be starting us off. Barbara is a pediatric, pardon me, occupational therapist with over 25 years of experience um, as a developmental practitioner, uh, and she's also a Montessori mom of 17 years. Um, sorry, 17 years as a practitioner, also a Montessori mom. Um, she sees a strong link between occupational therapy and Montessori education. And after many years of providing workshops and consultations at Montessori schools, uh, Barbara's work has become focused on inclusion in Montessori. And she has also presented internationally at the Montessori World Congress on these topics um, and also addressing the needs of children with attention difficulties and the benefits of multidisciplinary collaboration in a Montessori environment. And then finally, we have Professor Lane Bramapov. She's the founder of the Montessori Applied Behavioral Analysis Therapy Program for Children with Autism. Um, she received the Premier's Award from the Government of Ontario in 2005 for this unique program blend. And she has lectured and been a keynote speaker in various cities around the world. She's a published writer and she co-chairs the advisory board for MMPI with Dr. Joyce Pickering. 
Um, she is a professor for the Faculty of Applied Health and Community Studies at Sheridan College. Um, and she also has a Master's of Health Studies and an AMS Early Childhood credential. Um, she is additionally regist registered Early Childhood Educator in Ontario and has her certification in Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Children and Youth. So I'm going to turn things over to Catherine now to get us started, um, but we look forward to hearing from all of you in just a moment. Thank you, Kelly, for your kind words of introduction. Um, Michelle, Barbara, and I are very happy to be here online with all of you to discuss helping kids develop their ability to attend. And I just, I just want to start out by acknowledging all of you parents and teachers who've had your world turned upside down by COVID-19 about, you know, how you've had to change rules, collaborate more. Your parents have had to become home teachers. Teachers have become virtual 2D teachers and parent coaches. And we've all been pushed in new ways we never would have imagined. And hopefully it's um, making us all stronger. But I want to acknowledge everybody here. So I'm going to talk uh, to start out with um, about attention uh, more uh, generally. And then Barbara and Michelle will give more specific uh, information tools uh, for working with particular children at home or at school. Um, so I want to start out by thinking a little more broadly about attention as a cognitive faculty um, and just point out something that we often take for granted, that um, attention is a feature of development and there's a develop that um, attention develops over time um, and there are disorders of attention which are a little bit different than that. And both of those factors are important to keep in mind when you're working with both typical children and with children who you think are maybe, you know, there's a little something going on there because they're um, having struggles with being able to pay attention. So, um, but it's really important to remember that attention is not just a thing that happens. It's a developmental process and it's influenced by um, genetics and it's influenced uh, a lot by the environment. And it's really a foundational part of the Montessori educational system. Everything is based on attention in Montessori. So, um, and then we'll ta I'll talk a little bit more about um, the when, when something's going a little bit off a typical path and you may be thinking about a disorder of attention. So, um, so we, thinking about attention as a dynamically evolving developmental process. And um, as I mentioned, it has a genetic component. Um, and I will point out, by the way, a lot of people don't know eight, if the um, disorder of ADHD is the most highly genetically heritable psych psychiatric issue of any um, issue. So um, that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking along those lines if you have people in your family who have ADHD like I do. <laughs> um, also, that there's a large environmental component, and um, so that we'll talk a little bit about that. So, whether the child, whether you're at home with your child or the child is in school, it's really important to um, pay attention to the environment that the child is in and how conducive it is to paying attention. Um, so, things like smells, sounds, what's on the walls, visual. Um, if you're at home with your kids and um, you know, you want, to, you want to sort of stand back and look at the environment where your child is working on their schoolwork. And just as a Montessori teacher does, think about, oh, what are these things um, that are happening in a sensory basis that, um, that might interfere with the child's attending? So um, that's, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. And then, of course, um, in a Montessori environment, that's a big part of the teacher training and preparation of your classroom is... Um, so that the, you optimize the, the environment for the child's development of their attention. So I want to share a quote with you from Dr. Montessori that I find really helpful um, in understanding how the, the value and importance she placed on intention, uh, attention. And this is from the California Lectures of um, Maria Montessori, 1915. The fact on which it is possible to establish my system is the psychologic fact of the attention of the child 
intensively chained to any exterior object or fact which proves in the child a spontaneous, although complex, activity of its entire little personality. And you have solved the problem of controlling the attention of the child. You have solved the entire problem of his or her education. So um, she was. She worked initially, as probably all of you know, with uh, children with special needs. Um, and so she understood that if she couldn't get the attention of the children focused, she wasn't able to teach anything. Um, so um, when we're working with children, both typical or atypical in their development, we really want to pay attention to the importance of developing developing their ability to attend. So wherever they are, wherever you're starting with your child, whatever age they are, you know, right now, sort of how long can they, how long can they pay attention? Um, and how deep is their attention? Those are two factors uh, in my training um, that we really paid attention to. And we actually collected data. We tried to track how long is the child paying attention and how deep, that's a little more subjective, how deep is their attention? And um, in the Montessori world, those are more important than what they're learning. So, um, so that might be a new perspective for some parents. All right, so um, I'm gonna go over some key insights that come from Dr. Montessori's writing on attention, which help us in designing an environment and activities that will help our child develop attention. So the first thing is that Attention, as we've been talking, is not a static thing. It grows with practice and typically with age. So, um, but we need to provide an environment which encourages the paying of attention. And attention is not just looking and listening. Um, Dr. Montessori says it's one thing to attract the attention and it's another thing to actually hold it. She says it requires an external object or something on which the intelligence and the hands may work. So it's the, it's the manipulation and use and um, uh, work with the, the child's hands that creates their attention um, to the activity and draws them deeper into that and is really um, a strong, uh, powerful impact on their development of their attention. attention. So attention is not just sensory stimulation. Um, it has to engage the child's intellect. So unlike, um, you know, you might say, oh, my child can watch television forever and, you know, or computer games or anything electronic, really. Um, but those are kind of just flashing lights. It's a different kind of attention than the attention that comes from within because they, they are working with something that their intellect is involved with. So attention can be guided by the hands. And, um, and I find that really interesting when working with a lot of children who have, um, who are pretty hard to get to attend to anything, who have a very short attention span or who may be uh, distracted by a variety of things that um, Barbara and Michelle will talk more about. Um, really, the only way to fix their attention to get the process started is going to be through their hands. Um, and that's something that traditional education doesn't quite understand as well as we do in Montessori education. Um, and it, it, that, the, the use of the hands can be the key to the beginning of making progress with these children. Um, attention lays the foundation for concentrated work, or we, in Montessori we call it the normalization of the child's personality. And that's something that applies to all children. So um, all children benefit from an environment which encourages and activities that encourage their deep attention. And then the last point that she makes, attention that leads to concentrated work can only come from within. And, um, and so this is a very different idea of um, attention. I have um, both my traditional education degree and Montessori. And so, you know, in, in elementary education, traditional, we know that it's, you have to have the attention of the child, but we think of it more of, oh, we have to do things that are more exciting. We have to, you know, be more dramatic. We have to do this, that, and the other um, to get the child's attention. But Dr. Montessori is not talking about that kind of attention at all. She's talking about when the attention comes from 
the inside the child from the intellect when they apply their their whole little personality i love the way she says that um that they're really really interested so so one of the things you look for is um you look look for things observe for things that your child really likes to do for a lot of kids it's legos some children it's um play-doh some children it's water play it really it can be anything at all or for older children if they if they have passions of maybe cars or dinosaurs anything is fine but once you see that, that ability to for them to latch on to something they're interested in and have that deep attention that's the most valuable thing of all and um and so that's as montessorians our training is so different from a traditional educator because we do value that so much so um so then i wanted to talk about um some of the things that um if you if you have a child i mean these these are things that apply to any child but if you have a child who's really struggling with attention um there's some types of activities that are known to help a child um, develop some skills and attention and succeed um, and often children who have really um really big challenges have have adhd um they, school can be a nightmare for them from you know all the way through because their bodies just won't allow them to sit and pay attention um, pay attention to a teacher so they really really struggle so um dr montessori talked about this concept called mental hygiene so mental hygiene is this idea that and i'll read this quote from her instead of leaving everything to chance the child's growth at this time should be a matter for scientific care and attention this means that something more is needed than mere physical hygiene just as the latter ward off injuries to his body so we need mental hygiene to protect his mind and soul from harm so these are things that we can um, have our children involved when, with as they grow up that will give them anchors to be that happy successful child even if they do have an attentional disability so some of these you, you won't be surprised at all but others you know you can think about um, so one of them is lots of physical activity. I'm sure that you would realize that for children who are really busy. Um, musical training, skill development in music and the arts, that can end up being where they hang their hat in life. That's their um, ticket to fame. A proper diet is super important. Good sleep habits, really important. Uh, time in nature for mindfulness, meditation, teaching, explicit teaching of self-regulation and social skills. And also um, as they get older and up to the maybe adolescent level, providing an executive function coach. Um, and then overall limit exposure to all electronic devices because that's it's not helpful for children in their development of attention. So I think my time is probably up. Um, so we'll have more time to talk at the end with um, with some questions, um, but I'm going to turn it over to Barbara, who has um, a whole variety of different um, activities and tools to help your child attend to their work at school and at home. Barbara. Thanks, Katie. Thank you so much, Kelly, for having us here, and welcome all your parents and teachers. Um, I do have a PowerPoint to share with you. So I just thought I would uh, give you a little bit of a deeper understanding of what is occupational therapy. I feel like a lot of uh, disciplines of people who are working with children, speech language pathologists is pretty self-evident. People understand what that is, physical therapy. People understand that. But I feel like occupational therapy is very not not well understood. So I just put together this little PowerPoint to give you a few um, tips about what what it is that we do. So um, okay, let's see. So can I turn it, or you you have to move it? Okay. So um, mainly we're focused on developing, restoring, and maintaining. Uh, the, the person's ability to be successful in their occupations. And so when we're talking about the word occupations, we're not talking about work, we're talking about the roles that people play. You know, are you a daughter? Are you a teacher? Um, are you a mother? 
Um, are you a painter? Are you a knitter? You know, all of those things are occupations. Um, and for children, their occupation primarily is play, or as Dr. Montessori calls it, work. So um, we have a lot of training in medicine and psychology, and we're very holistic and creative thinkers. Okay. So, oh, you know, you have to hit it twice. I don't know why it has some of these separated things or, and again, maybe. So what we're trying to do is blend scientific and medical knowledge with an understanding of the person. So we look at gross and fine motor skills. We look at visual skills. You have to hit it again, please. Um, anatomy and physiology of all the body systems, neuroanatomy and kinesiology, and how these body systems are interdependent. I think there's one more. So human development across the lifespan. So we're really looking kind of, so we sort of break it down and look at all these parts and then trying to see how everything is interdependent. So I wanted to talk for a minute about sensory integration, which is um, a specialty area within occupational therapy. So not all OTs are pediatric OTs, and not all pediatric OTs are sensory integration specialists. But um, in any event, I want you to understand a little bit about it. So what we're talking about is the ability to take in information from all of the senses, efficiently respond with an adaptive, what they call an adaptive response. So we're talking about those five senses that everybody always talks about, but also the vestibular sense, which is in your ear and is giving your brain information about the position of your body in space, the position of your head in space, and are you moving what direction, how fast, is it dangerous, like are you falling? Um, the proprioceptive system, which is the joint and muscle sense, so that is giving your um, brain information about the position of your body and if your body's moving and what direction. And then interoception, which is a sort of newer area that they've been doing a lot of research on and it has to do with the internal sense sensory like am i hungry am i tired do i need to pee you know am i do i feel like i'm getting a cold all of those things and i feel like a lot of our kiddos who are having trouble attaining um the potty training milestones you know at the right time they aren't they aren't understanding those internal interoceptive messages and they're not um realizing maybe that even that they have to go or they're not you know understanding my the sensation of my bladder is full or how to control the sphincter muscles and they just um are having inefficient processing of interoceptive signals so difficulties with processing and also modulating meaning kind of staying in the middle um really disrupts self-regulation and attention and also executive functions so having that integration i mean i actually sometimes think maybe this diagram should be the other way around but foundationally one needs integration of all of these senses in order to regulate and one needs regulation in order to attend so it's really the basis of of being able to learn so in sensory integration terminology when we talk about top down versus bottom up if you have a child who is very dysregulated and very out of control and very inattentive because of that you want to think about what is a top down type of a message and what is a bottom up type of an intervention so top down would be sit down and pay attention <laughs> and we all know how well that works like not at all so bottom up means you're going to be trying to allow the child to engage in some kind of activity sensory based activity that will then travel through the body up the spinal column then into the brain so that's bottom up and that will help the child regulate and attend better so and just for your information that comes from the alert program um, so providing proprioceptive input is always a great way to help children get calm and get organized so what that means is 
um, activating the proprioceptive receptors, which are located in the joints and the muscles, and using those muscles against resistance. So it could be oral, like chomping on something crunchy, um, or it also could be compression or traction. So you could hang from a, you know, monkey bars or jumping on a trampoline where those joints are getting a lot of compression. So a big thing for parents and teachers to think about is creating opportunities for proprioceptive input. Playground play is great, digging in the garden, watering um, things, as well as water play, swimming, carrying laundry or groceries, a lot of household um, you know, activities that you can engage them in helping you with are going to be really rich in proprioception. So here are some examples of line work that we've done with kids at Montessori schools, but you can certainly put down a piece of masking tape and get out your rolling pin and off they go. If you put a piece of tape around your rolling pin, you can get them to try to match up the rolling pin tape with the tape on the floor. And then this little gal on the right is using a weighted ball and she's just kind of crawling along and trying to keep the ball on the line. Anything you do with rubber bands is going to give a lot of, you know, very fine motor, but a lot of resistance and that's proprioceptive input. So in this particular um, whisking activity, I added a little bit of weight. It is not really something parents should do without oversight from their OT, but um, in general, they could do something like carrying a um, heavy stuffed animal would, would be sort of a similar thing. And that they, you can do that obviously without the oversight of an OT because the child can always put it down when they're done. And pulling, pushing, hanging from ropes, so playground, um, playing tug of war, being in a tire swing, working on all fours is going to do a lot to help build shoulder stability. Using a hammer and, um, you know, banging golf tees into a, you know, pie tin full of clay or whatever. So you can set something like that up at home. And creating a wall push-up station. So very simple. They can um, either do that by themselves. If you do that side by side with another child, then that will help them regulate and kind of co-regulate with the other child. So I believe, oh, I know that. I just wanted to point out, that was my last slide. I wanted to just point out in the handouts section, um, you can go forward, Kelly, that um, there's this tips for parent teachers, which is a little ebook that I wrote for parents who are home being teachers. Um, and it's a lot of sensory ideas and activities for you to use at home and you can download it. Um, I'm not sure, Kelly, you have to tell them where they, how they do that. Yeah, there's a little tab that says handouts, um, and there are two there. One of them is the ebook that Barbara mentioned, and the other is, I think, your August course um, handout. So that's all I have for a little introduction, and we can certainly talk more with questions after, and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for having us. <laughs> I'm so happy to share um, our backgrounds and to, we're always, I know for myself, I'm always happy to learn from others as well. Um, so Kelly has also shared a, a little PowerPoint uh, that I put together. So, um, so focusing on attention and autism. So you can turn the, the next slide, please. <laughs> So when you look at the um, the diagnosis, uh, the diagnostic criteria for autism, um, we do see that there is an issue around attention. So some people don't necessarily see that in autism or, or recognize it. Um, so what we notice is children typically are overly focused, almost obsessive about certain things, um, or are very distracted and can't can sort of uh, stay attention. Um, so it's common in autism as well as having hyperactive behavior. So that's part of the DSM-5, which is um, how you diagnose autism spectrum. Next slide. Um, so one of the core deficits is joint attention. So what we're doing, if we were all together in a lecture hall, for example, and the PowerPoint was up 
on the podium, uh, above the podium, uh, we would look at the PowerPoint and then look at each other and look back. Um, that's what's considered joint attention. And um, individuals with uh, on the spectrum, typically research has shown to have a real deficit in this area. So we can't expect it from our kids. Um, so the eye contact, there are a lot of children that are paying attention to you, <laughs> but they're not giving you the eye contact. That that's another step that is really challenging. So oftentimes when we're working with children, um, what we would typically think as typically developing individuals, um, that if you're giving the eye contact, that means you're paying attention, does not hold true uh, for children on the autism spectrum. Next slide, please. <laughs> Um, then the executive functions, I think uh, Catherine was speaking to this earlier. Um, so that's part of the brain that works on problem solving. And so this is an area um, that is really challenging for a lot of children on the spectrum. Again, it's, it's a spectrum. So, you know, there are no two children alike. <laughs> so that's really important. Um, so that part of the brain um, can be also linked to being impulsive. It's impulsive behaviors, and you'll see some children being very impulsive. So that's, again, um, part of why I'm sharing this is it's part of having autism. And we have to understand that as educators, as parents, that this is our child, you know, and we have to accept and understand who they are. Next slide, please. Um, so also the behaviors, repetitive behaviors, rigid, meaning, you know, not being able to go from one thing to the next very easily or, or at all sometimes um, can be really challenging to help a child maintain attention, especially if you're trying to teach new skills. Next slide, please. Um, so also autism and ADHD for a long time, um, these two before the DSM-5 came, came out um, in the DSM-4, they said that these two disorders could not co-occur, but they actually can. We've seen always a similarity and so now they are they can co-occur. Um, so it, before the new DSM-5, the new, 2013, the DSM-5 came out. It's not new anymore, but before it came out, um, lack of attending, uh, which was a symptom of ADHD, was seen in about 50% of children that were previously uh, diagnosed with autism uh, in the previous diagnostic manual. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? <laughs> All this um, sort of technical information. Um, so as an educator, parent, we have to work with the child's interest. So, um, and that's similar to what Montessori, you know, talked about creating an environment that really developed children's critical thinking and, and being engaged in learning. And I will say that, um, you know, as an early childhood educator registered in Ontario and from, from Canada, um, that is something that we also preach that our children be engaged. It's not about, you know, how flashy can an activity be, it's how engaged, how focused can children get. Um, so typically children do have, um, and children on the autism spectrum have difficulty focusing on activities that are not intrinsic. And so Montessori, that's what we want. We want our kids to be intrinsically motivated, not externally motivated. Um, and so that can be really hard. Um, and then you may have, obviously there are, there are activities um, or things that are of interest and it might be sort of a hyper focus that they don't want to try something else and they need to in order to develop uh, their skills overall. So things that we want to do is just try to look at our classrooms or as a parent, look at our, our environment, what are we working with our kids and make sure that there are things that are going to compel our kids to be interested. Next slide, please. So this is something uh, that was taken from a typical choice board, and I'll just show what a regular choice board looks like. It doesn't have any pictures, but you can put different items with pictures on here and a child would choose. Um, typically, and I say typically again, because autism is a spectrum disorder, so no two, two kids are alike, um, but typically children on the autism spectrum are visual learners. And so I just created um, a, sort of a binder for my kids who were in Montessori um, to be able to have a choice board essentially and then create a schedule. And once they were done, you know, a certain activity, you would take it off 
and put it in in the binder isn't all done i'm finished with that and it helps to support that idea that things are moving ahead it appeals to um the diagnosis of routine of rigid almost rigidness that oh well we're going to do this so you're going to do this activity and then this activity and then you're done and so we're appealing to that in terms of a teaching model next slide please and then you have the same concept of a first Ben board. So you might say to your child, whether they're at home learning or at school, first you're going to do some chalk drawing and then you can do the water play, um, you know, or something else. Um, usually the then is something that the child wants to do, it's very um, enticed. And the first thing is what you're trying to make sure that they're, they're learning. Next slide, please. Um, so this, uh, I used to have a school, um, it closed in 2010, but it was the first Montessori school for children with autism, which was when I combined um, the Montessori curriculum with applied behavior analysis to create a new type of program. Um, so something that we do typically um, in ABA is figuring out what is going to be reinforcing for the child. We want it to be very positive. And so, um, you know, we don't want to use aversives. I know some behaviorists do, but you want it. What, what I personally believe in and, and what I preach is about having positive, making the learning a, an enjoyable task, right? The word task in, its, in and of itself may not be the right term, but um, the next slide, please. It shows the, the, this a little better. So we would have, um, so for children, when I had my school, most of our children were nonverbal and were coming to our program because they were on the severe end of the spectrum, so needed a lot of support. You can ask, what do you like? But of course, if you have a child, ask them. <laughs> you know, if they can answer, tell them, what, what do you like? Or ask their parents. Um, but if you have a child who you're, you're not sure, have a series of items in front of them. If you say, here's a book or here's some bubbles, and they go, <laughs> no, thank you, that would be rejected, no. Or if they're not even reacting to it, then, you would take that off if they're reaching for certain items that's an aha okay i think we have something here um shows sign of pleasure protest when taken away again that shows you that it's more something they like a little bit more um and takes again is something that hopefully we think is reinforcing so then we would have a list of different items see where they rank so on the right hand side it has ranks so you'd see which one is the most reinforcing and so when they do something you give them a little, like, you know, if, if it wasn't intrinsically motivated, we want intrinsic motivation, but if it wasn't intrinsically motivated, then we would use these tools to help develop that. Next slide, please. Um, this is another example of a visual support. So you would have um, a student who might have pictures. It could be written down depending on the developmental age of the child. But okay, you're gonna do these four things and when they're done, then you get to spend X amount of time on the computer. Again, we are trying to limit screen time. And I know right now during the pandemic, that's been very challenging. I'm also a Montessori mom. and We've just been like, well, you're gonna get a little more screen time than you used to. But uh, anyways, you do your best as a, as a parent. Um, next slide, please. You can also do this can be problematic. <laughs> Sometimes they only work for these auction points, uh, like any reinforcer, but there are some kids that they go, oh, if I do these different tasks and I get a certain amount of points, um, it's almost like playing a video game. You collect your coins and I get to get my, you know, whatever it is at the end, um, I get to go out for pizza or I get something um, is another way. The point of this is to delay that reinforcement so the child isn't getting it immediately all the time. Um, but again, you have to you have to be careful <laughs> when you're using these, these motivators. Next slide. And then there are timers. And as I mentioned before, that children, uh, well, individuals uh, with autism usually are visual learners. So this is a visual timer. You can also get them as a watch. You know, you can get them big in the classroom. We see them a lot in our classrooms here in Toronto, our public schools. Um, so it's just a way to see that the time is passing. You can get some that actually ring, some that don't, depending on the child's um, needs. Next slide, please. 
Uh, Barbara spoke beautifully about sensory stimulation and um, just that it, that is a whole other issue. So we don't want to put in a behavioral plan if the child is struggling um, with it with another issue. So that we want to make sure there's nothing else going on with their body before we would start putting in a behavioral strategy. Next slide, please. Um, and looking at your space. So maybe there's too much going on. Maybe there's not enough. Some kids need more uh, stimulation to have that self-regulation and to focus. And some kids need a lot less. So you have to know your, your child. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Let's see. I am going to go over here to the questions. I've been so focused on the slides. I haven't even had a chance to look. So I could um, I could start out. I thought we, each of us would start with a question and then we'll open yeah. it up more. Um, so great. I know we, we just got a, a ton of information and um, it's really hard to um, to kind of see how to apply all that information right away. But um, so the question I'd like to um, address is what can I do to support my child's learning at home um, if they have attentional challenges? So if you have a child with ADHD or a child who you have some um, concerns about their attention, what can you do to help them? Um, so one of the things uh, Michelle already talked about was visual schedules. And visual schedules are really helpful. It's, it's a strategy that, um, that children with ADHD can use their whole lives is um, a, a schedule that they can check off. It doesn't have to be pictures, although for younger kids, it's more effective to start with pictures. Um, but as they get older, just a written list. You know, we all do our lists. <laughs> a lot of us do, especially if you have ADHD in your family. Um, but it is, it is an organizational stru structure that is outside your body that helps keep your mind ordered. Um, so, Dr. Montessori talked about how the order of the environment helps us order our minds. Well, children who have um, ADHD, it's a, it's a neurochemical disorder, a difference. They don't have that and they can't control and keep in order their, their minds the same way a typical child can. It's, a, it's an invisible disability, but it, it really is real. Um, so visual uh, schedules or lists, if it doesn't, if you're doing helping your child do a list, ideally you want to model it first for your child, and then you want to help teach them to develop their own list because they they have more ownership of it if they do it themselves. Um, so it, if if it doesn't seem to be working, try going bigger because sometimes it's it's a perceptual thing. If you work with a lot of kids with different all different kinds of differences, you you find that size makes a big difference on um, how effective an intervention might be. So um, maybe you have a, a whiteboard easel and you can start out with something large and then over time, by the time they're in high school, maybe their list is this big. <laughs> but when you first start out, try to find a size and, a, and an organization that the child um, really feels, you know, they, they usually like it. They, they usually like checking off the boxes and it's a pleasant thing. Um, with work plans, this work plan is kind of like the same thing, but a child with attentional challenges is going to need a lot more adult guidance in developing the work plan and then keeping track of it, even where it is. You know, kids they, with attentional challenges, they don't even know where their work plan is half the time. So um, that's, that's one of those areas where they're going to take a lot more guidance and help and maybe thinking outside the box, thinking bigger, thinking attached to the wall where it can't be lost. So you got to think a little creatively to, to have a work plan that's going to work for them. Um, and then Michelle mentioned timers. I want to show another one that I love. One. <laughs> These are teacher created materials, but you can buy them online. They're really big. Uh, they don't make noise. And um, visually, I, I find them nicer. They come in all different lengths of time. This is a five minute, but they have one minute, two minute, five minute, 10, 20. So, um, and, and over time, you want to work up their ability to attend for longer. So again, attention is a developmental process and you want to keep track of, well, where are they now? And then keep track of that and see if you can get that to grow. Um, and grow longer. And again, 
except for electronic like games and movies you can't count those but um, any type of activity if it's art if it's you know anything that they love um, and then another really important um, concept in helping children attend to work if they have um, a school assignment that they need to do and they just you just can't get them to sit down to do it sometimes the physical presence of the adult is an anchor for them so if you sit next to them and maybe at first you might have to be pretty involved with you know keeping them well now let's try the next one or now let's do this you know what's next um, but gradually you want to fade that away you want to fade that back and um, eventually you'll be able to kind of pull out something you need to do on the side. Um, just kind of plan when you, you have work like balancing your checkbook or whatever, that not, not screen stuff um, preferably, but you know, something that you can do, something you have to read or even the paper. Once you get them started, you want to fade a little, you want to be able to turn and work on what you're working on. This is my work. I'm going to work on my work while you work on your work. And it's really quite, quite an amazing thing that the physical presence of you're, you're there, you're like a support for them. You're like a, a blanket on their attention. And you're, um, it, it really helps a lot. Uh, you just have to find ways that it's not so time consuming for you. Um, the other thing to always remember is that attention is developmental. So you might have to start out doing some things that you know are not sustainable in your home life or even teachers at school. You know that that you can't that child can't have that level of of support by another adult all the time. But if you have your strategies organized and your teaching skills through those strategies, over time you will be able to fade back. Um, and one last thing I want to point out is um, peer support. That's um, really underutilized um, resource in a, either in a classroom or at home is having um, a child, um, either, well, often older child works better because they have more um, control of, over their, their selves, um, but having them help the child, younger child with their activity or do an activity jointly. And kids love to work with other kids. And um, that's, you know, well-known uh, fact. And so if you can get another child to be that anchor you know, and it's that's a little trickier because the other children can sometimes not be such a good model. But um, so you have to pick pick wisely <laughs> when you pick your pairs. But I've seen it um, work amazingly at, at the school I was director at. We had two little boys who were just all over the place. Kids with ADHD love they see each other. They recognize themselves in each other and they can blow up a classroom when they get together. So. Um, but we found that we took an easel and had each one of them working on the other side so that they could peek around, they could see each other, they knew they were there. And it, it was amazing. It was like a miracle. They both sat there and did their work on the easel. So, um, and again, like Barbara's talking about using your body, um, working on an easel, even if the work is normally not something you would have a child do on an easel, having them either sitting or standing, they're using more of their body, more of their joints, um, that also can be a strategy to, to affix their attention because their body is more active. Um, uh, one of my daughters who has ADHD, she says it's just torture. She says, you know, I'm like a shark. My brain dies if I'm not moving. <laughs> and um, so it's, it, it really is true that you need to find ways that they can be productive, be lear learning things while they're moving. And um, Barbara also has some great strategies in term related to positioning. Um, I don't know if you had um, those in your PowerPoint, Barbara, but stand a standing work that a standing table or work table. So it's high enough so that they can get the proper, you know, their elbows are um, the right height from the table, but they can stand and do their work. You'll find a lot of kids who have attentional challenges, they won't ever sit down for more than two minutes. But if you can have them stand at the table, then they can sometimes work for a very long time. Um, and then in terms of listening, they, you know, walking around the perimeter of a room while they're listening, um, they can, 
they, they can pay attention if their bodies are moving. And it's kind of like Michelle was talking about with the eye contact, um, understanding that a child with, with um, autism, listening takes a lot of brain activity and so does looking at a person in the eye is overwhelming. And I have a nephew who said when he, he didn't, he said this as a teenager looking back, you know, he said, you know, I couldn't understand why people were always telling me to look at them. And, and while they were talking, he said, I can listen to what they're saying, or I can look in their eyes, but I can't do both at the same time. So um, the types of things that we're talking about um, are observations, you know, where you get to know what it's like on the in interior of that child's mind and their bodies. What, what is it like to be them? And, and have that Montessori faith in your child that all children want it, they want to learn. All children want to learn and grow and be part of the community. Um, even when they're throwing a massive tantrum, you know, that's just telling you that they've had too much. They're, they can't handle what whatever's going on. But um, having that faith in the child and then working together, partnering together to find a way <clears throat> that they can reveal how they can learn. That's and that that puts them on that developmental path of attention because they figure out how in their body how they can learn, how they can attend. And then they know that will serve them all of their life to understand that about themselves. And so, um, Barbara, do you want to answer a question you have prepared? Do you want, do you have um, audience questions, Kelly? I do, yeah, maybe we can, can okay. um, answer a couple of those and then see if we have a little bit more time. Um, the time has just gone by so quickly. Uh, one question we got was, uh, what approach would you recommend to work a child out of technology addiction to tablet and TV? Ooh. The big talk. <laughs> That's, it, the best thing is not to go there, but. Um, it, Very you, fair, though. So, so yeah. start, start with the, start collecting data. So what are they doing? I mean, track the hours. What time of day are they watching? How, how long are they watching? And then find structures to work that down. Okay. And, um, oh, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, go ahead. you have something? Sorry, you want me to? Okay, yeah. Um, I, I, would to, like were say yeah something. I, I would use it as a way, as a reinforcement, because I, I think most of us <laughs> parents, our kids are on technology. I mean, we're in a pandemic, and I think that it's just, a lot of our schools just told us too, they're like, don't shame yourself because we've had to adjust and it's been really hard, especially for parents that are working and have kids home. It's just, it's really hard. Um, so I would start to wean them off of whatever it is that you've been doing um, uh, and using it as a reinforcement. So, hey, like maybe in the morning, you're going this, this, let's go outside, maybe go for a walk if you can, do that kind of thing, um, get them out, <laughs> if you're allowed to, it depends on where you're living, of course, um, and then be like, okay, at lunch or at a certain time, now you can have X amount of time on your video, um, and then have a little bit more activities if they're able to read a book or something else. And then they do, and I'm doing that with my own kids. So I'm, <laughs> I'm preaching what I, what I'm saying. I'm doing it as well because we're like we, we can't keep going down this road. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question is, how can I tell the difference between run-of-the-mill distraction and something you know that might need more evaluation? Hmm. I think, so, I so think um, a run-of-the-mill distraction would you would see the child maybe in different um, settings or different activities having being different and i think an adhd type type of thing is like wherever they are whatever they're doing it's it's there and it's very intense um and you know the thing that is difficult is i attention is like this two-sided coin so one side is you know, oh, I'm thinking this and then, oh, wait, I'm, I'm thinking this and I'm going off on all these tangents. But the other side of the coin is I'm doing this and I'm only doing this and I can't attend to 
anything else. It's like hyper focus. So you have this kind of disorganized non focus or hyper focus, and those are both kind of disorders of attention. But, um, you know, I've seen a lot of kids who come into my practice and the parents are like, well, you know, every time it's language arts time, you know, they're bouncing off the walls and the teacher, you know, thinks we should go to the doctor and get Ritalin. And it's like, well, but the child can focus in a lot of other settings and is not distracted. But the fact that it's the language arts time where they're really falling apart, there's your clue that maybe they have a language learning difficulty that's that's making it so that that activity is really hard for them and then they find it really hard to stay focused on it. I don't know if that answers the question per se, but. Yeah, and I also wanna add that um, ADHD or attentional challenges go along with all kinds of other um, issues. Uh, autism and uh, dyslexia, the overlap is pretty large with sensory. So um, it's really important to get a, a full multidisciplinary evaluation, uh, you know, a workup and, um, and really find out what's going on. Because, I mean, even down to the, just a trip to the pediatrician to see, you know, thyroid disorders can inter interfere with attention and, um, and other types of um, health issues that like uh, lead, lead, if you have lead in the blood, can also uh, look like ADHD, but also dyslexia. Um, and as Barbara was saying, kids who have learning disabilities, um, they, they look like they can't ever sit down and do paper and pencil work, but there's something going on um, that's different in the way they learn. And so that's a, that's a totally different intervention. Um, but a lot of kids have both. Um, and I, I want to show you this. Um, this book is called Corey Stories. It's a kid's book about living with ADHD. And it's a fabulous story. For, it's meant for kids. But it's about this little boy who tells in first person, you know, what it's like, how he's always falling off his chair and he doesn't know how it happened. But, you know, and he's always losing things and he talks too close to his friends and and, and all of his struggles. And then, you know, um, all, it's just it's a fabulous it's a fabulous resource because it is it's very complicated and it's a very it can be very disabling thing for a child to have ADHD. But. If you address the ADHD and they still have um, dyslexia, they're still not going to learn how to read. <laughs> so um, it's super important for you to know what what is going on. And and in, in um, developmental science today, there's they know um, that it, the brain differences and all about them and they're genetic and they're present. You know, often during pregnancy, they go all the way back and they're part of the child. And once you know. What, what your child's um, character is, or characteristics, then you know how to address them. And then the child can help them, learn to help themselves. They will have it their, their whole life, so. This might be our last question, um, and it's just being mindful of the time here. This parent says, um, I have an eight-year-old who was recently diagnosed with ADHD. Are there any alternatives to medication? So um, the, uh, you can always try. They always say the best practice is to try um, all the non-medication interventions first. I mean, it's all about trying to see what works for your child. Um, the Shelton School in Texas did a two-year stu uh, study um, called Enhancing Educational Achievement, Reducing the Effects of ADHD Learning Differences with Exercise. So they put... Um, exercise bikes in the classrooms and the children had to they had to do it a very specific way because it was an intervention they had to get up to the right heart rate you know but they used they were taught to use exercise bikes um, as a way of coping with their ADHD and um, there were some there were some kids who felt they could go off their medicine but the other kids who just felt that they were even with the medicine they were a lot more successful and felt better um, with that exercise, but it, intense exercise is one. Looking at all of those things that um, I had listed off, making sure the, the sleep, because a child with ADHD often has dysregulated sleep, and then that it can just snowball the impact. Um, looking at diet, Katie, yeah. OT, yes. try OT. 
Definitely. And a, lot, a lot of times kids come to me or parents come to me because they don't want to medicate their kids. And so you, we can create a, a home program that's, you know, that's sort of sensory based and we can maybe get the child, you know, a little bit more on that sort of typical continuum so that they can, they can manage it and not have to take the medications. In, in some cases, they don't ever take the medication. In some cases, we're able to put it off for a number of years. So you're not, you know, if you can wait till to medicate till they're eight instead of when they're starting when they're six, it, you know, as long as you can wait, the, the longer the better. So but the plug for OT there. Yeah, but it really depends on the child because for some children, I, you know, I've seen some kids in kindergarten who's who are so severe that they they weren't safe leaving the school. I mean, they tried. They, we would have to tackle them sometimes to keep them from running out of the school. Um, but we had to we had to help the parents take the child to the car and put them in because the parent could not control the child once they left the front of the, the front door of the school and it was they could have get hit by a car and killed. Um, so you know, and then the other thing to remember about med so some kids absolutely need medication it's just like getting your insulin if you need it or your treatment for the thyroid um, their brain it's a brain condition where the neurotransmitters are not firing properly and they're not your brain is not working and they can't help it so that's the very severe case where they absolutely need it but the other thing to remember is that medication is not a magic pill in that it solves all the child's problems so um, if the child is eight years old and they're on medication the medication could really could really start helping them but you still have to go back and backfill the social skills that they missed when they were um, you know not paying attention the uh, executive functioning skills um, and so you it's you you can't just sort of say here take your medicine now you're all good they still need a lot of support but you could be saving their lives too. Also, a child who really needs that medication will find ways of self-medicating um, if they don't get met, uh, proper medication. If you wait till adolescence to try to start that, that often doesn't work. They're very resistant. Um, so they will get in uh, are at risk for getting into other things. And these are kids like my daughter was into sugar and caffeine. <laughs> she would get up in the middle of the night and into the sugar and caffeine, you know, they find ways because that helps them regulate. It's a chemical imbalance in their brain. And so a proper, you know, what I would say is make sure you're seeing somebody who's ex, who has real expertise in the medication um, because it's complicated. But today they have better um, options and they, they track it more carefully. It's much better than 20 years ago. Um, they can they can help a lot better. So, well, thank you so much, the three of you, for joining us today. Um, some of you may also be interested. We're running a webinar next week on reluctant readers and writers. Um, same time a week from now on July seventh. Um, and I also had a couple of questions about um, how people can access this recording, and you will be able to find it probably by tomorrow on the Guidepost Montessori YouTube channel. Um, and if people would like to access resources from your organization, how can they do that? Oh, we, it's, it's um, very easy. www.montessori number four inclusion.org. <laughs> number four, yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Great to see everybody. Yes. Yeah.